Disruptors, curious minds, CEOs, founders, professionals, book lovers. Welcome to Thinking on Paper. This is Book Club. And admitting you're wrong isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Admitting that someone has a better explanation than you shows that you're adaptable. Facing reality takes courage. It takes courage to revise your ideas or rethink something you thought you knew. It takes courage to tell yourself something is not working. It takes courage to accept feedback that bruises your self-image. The challenge of facing reality is ultimately the challenge of facing ourselves. Clear thinking, part two. This is the territory we're going into. If you missed last week's book club where we examined chapter one, link is in the comments, go check it out. Jeremy, part two of Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. Tell me about it. What did you first takes? What's it about? Yeah, man, this is this is this was a really cool chapter. Um, obviously, kind of built on uh, the stuff we did before. There's so many different pieces to to dig into on this one. Yeah. I think um, one of the first things that that came out of this that that I had kind of highlighted was expect more of yourself, which um, you know, which is interesting. It, it, it can it can seem harsh in one way but like if you don't do it it's uh you're not doing yourself justice right like we're capable of more as individuals and sometimes as individuals we need someone to nudge us and hold ourselves accountable and and that can be us if we're in the right frame of mind if we're thinking clearly right this we're not holding ourselves to the level that we should hold ourselves we are capable of more and that comes via clearer thinking um and yeah. courage like you said too it takes courage to do that it takes courage to hold ourselves accountable it takes courage to see ourselves when we're not on the path that we want to be or when something's not working and we've invested in that one thing for so long it becomes part of us and it's so hard to decouple ourselves from it and um recognizing that it's a biological default and not a uh, not a personal defect, I think, is is interesting to think about, right? I like that. Not a biological default. No, it's a biological default, not a personal defect. Yeah, um, there was a very my first overriding impression of part two. Very stoic. The power of four. I mean, so um, he speaks about the four strengths, self-accountability, self-knowledge, self-control, self-confidence. It reminded me of the, the four stoic virtues. Um, I think he's borrowed heavily from that. You know, you can't, the only thing you can control is your reaction to the stimuli that your behavior to a, an event. Um, you know, the, what well, was, um, be, be strong, be funny, be courageous, be kind, temperance, justice, um, courage, wisdom, kind of all of these meshed together to to bring us to self-realization of yeah to self-realization to think clearer yeah the, there, there's uh, definitely yeah. stoic vibes to this and, yeah. and what shane Parrish has always done so well is is take um tried and true methodologies philosophies and interconnect them in a way that is tangible yeah. You know, Ryan Holiday does a great job of that as well. We've referenced some of his books before. Um, one of the things, so this is, this is, this might be a little bit of a dip into so stoicism, but like what, what I found that was, that was pretty interesting is, is what he called habits, paths, and outcomes. And that, you know, each one kind of leads to the other. So habits lead to paths and paths lead to eventual outcomes. Now, when you, when you think about, when you think about habits, habits are, habits are a little difficult and people get squirrely with, with, oh man, I gotta, I have to do this. I have to, I have to lose weight. I have to eat healthier. I, I you know, I, I need to read more, those sort of things. Um, I thought what was interesting is a precursor to a habit is establishing rules. Yeah. He's and like these, these automatic rules. Exactly. Cause we need that. We make so many damn decisions every day that we need, we need proven shortcuts, heuristics that we can rely on. And, and, you know, an example of one of those rules is like, Hey, you know, don't take any meetings, 
before lunch, right? Protect your morning time is one one that he had referenced, how did, right? How did you know that's mine? Is it, that's one of mine? I don't. I purposely don't. I, I write in the morning. I don't have meetings. Is do you have that? Do you have any automatic rules? It's one hundred percent. One hundred percent. That's that's one of my automatic rules. Is is protect my pr protect my time when um, I have the highest creative energy, and not to overload uh, my not not to increase my cognitive load. Uh, unless I'm doing it for myself, right? I got to protect time and energy for myself. And I do that in the morning very rigorously. Like uh, I, I defend that time pretty rigorously. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you got to yeah. jump on something, but um, yeah, no, that is. And, and by rules, like if you have a rule, this is really interesting. So the psychology of this, and he references it a little bit in, in the book. If you have a rule, if you say, hey, you know, I, I have a rule that I don't do X, Y, Z, I'm more apt as a human to be like, okay, and kind of respect that because it's a rule you have instead of saying, hey, can we meet at noon instead? And I'm like, Mark, Mark, I really want to meet in the morning. Why can't you meet in the morning? But if it's a rule, it's a little more sacred, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, and it also makes it easier to, to, you don't need to defend your decision if it's a rule. It, it makes it much easier to say no or yes, because that is your go to answer and if you don't have that then it's all maybe yes maybe no do you have any others i mean i have like no coffee after one o'clock that's a rule um, my meeting my meeting my mornings on my own what i liked was his don't say yes or no when the opportunity is given wait until the the next day before you say yes or no which i thought having that as, as an automatic rule is something i'm going to try to to employ yeah, I think holding space for reasoning, I think is how he how he phrases it. I think it's yeah, it's super important. So there, out, out of this writing experiment that I did years ago, I think I told you about it that turned into turned into this right to know you program. I created a, an energy an energy matrix for myself that is kind of like these rules and it's not a hard and fast no, but if if a decision comes my way and it's a it's a heavy yes on, you know, three or four of these rules, I'll likely I'll likely do that thing. So number one is like provide stability and opportunity for my family. So that's time and energy. That's financial. That's all of that stuff. Um, build cool things with amazing people. Super vague, but you know, <laughs> right? Thinking on paper is cool thing. You're amazing. That's why I'm oh, doing yeah. it, right? That um, amazing. Yeah, and and uh, you know, and, and some some others that that I have that help me with decision making because, like we said before, we make so many decisions all the time. Um, tell me about how you did, did the kind versus nice, uh, yeah, subject, yeah. uh, bump up. What did you, what did you think about that? Yeah. Um, what page I, I highlighted that I remember that and I hadn't thought of it in that way. I thought it was a very astute piece. Yeah. Why, piece why you're looking, why you're looking for that? I, the way I registered that was like, you know, a kind person will tell you the hard things that will make you better. And a nice person will avoid telling you that to keep the peace is is how I kind of landed on it. Yeah, he uses the example of having like spinach in your teeth. A nice person will not tell you you have spinach on your, in your teeth, but a kind person will. Um, I, I want to find the exact the, the exact wording because I thought it was very useful. But essentially, it was that. Um, can you be nice and kind? That that's what the question had jumped out of me. That's a really good question. I think. Well, what are those things, right? Like, um, nice is maybe more polite, more more sh more finite moment focused. Like, am I nice in this moment? Well, you could be a nice person, I guess, too. Kindness goes deeper to me, I think. Kindness, there is a deeper connection to the person you're interacting with and you're genuinely interested in who they are, what the moment is, and how you can maybe help them. I just think kindness is a little deeper than than nice. And I'm going to try to find people with stuff stuck in their teeth so I can practice my kindness. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> great. Bring it to their attention. Hey, by the way... Um, I'll start but, popping it in for the shows. I'll have it here and see if you do it or not. I know we're going to talk about parenting at some point. We speak about parenting quite a lot, but kids do that. They just say, "Look, you've got, look, you've got that in your face." 
<laughs> there's just no, no, nothing but kindness. I mean, is it kindness or is it just uh, say what you see? I don't know. Um, that was good. I liked the bit on, um, okay, you asked me about kindness and niceness, which if you just see it, you might think they're the same. They're not. Um, confidence versus ego. Um, he speaks about that. While the ego tries to prevent you from acknowledging any deficiencies you may have, self-confidence gives you the strength to acknowledge those deficiencies. This is how you learn humility. Confidence without humility is generally the same thing as overconfidence. So there's a fine line there. There's a balancing act between overconfidence and self-confidence. What's it really humility? What's humility, Jeremy? Yeah, going back to stoicism on that, humility is a very, very big theme that at least in the books that I've read in, in that world. And um, I think the way I think about humility is, you know, you're while you're while you're confident in your your knowledge, your experience, kind of this the seed of yourself, like you're confident in self-awareness, you're also open to the idea that you may not always be right and you're open to the idea of someone else holding another perspective and and being okay with oh that's a that's a new perspective let's explore that instead of locking in yeah um again he says the courage to um there's one he's talking to a ceo i don't remember the name but he says if you could pick one trait that you would predict how someone would turn out what would it be that's easy. He said how willing they are to change their mind about what they think they know. Oh, that was the story about the the two, the CEO that came to him after the talk that basically was like, hey, uh, I'm going after or the, 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 the person that was going after the CEO job. And they had a position um, on a particular solution. And the other person that was uh, in line for that CEO job had another position on a solution, right? And she knew the other CEO's position was the right one, but she wanted to make sure she inserted her perspective and her stamp and her value. Yeah. She ended up agreeing with the other C potential CEO solution. And that led them to giving her the job yeah. because they showed that she was open to new ideas, adaptable. And that's, I think it, adaptivity is, is that a word? Adaptivity, adaptivity, I think. It is, it is now. It is now. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest biggest things that we can teach our kids is how to be adaptable, right? And how to be open to the fact that the truth, that something that, that we call the truth is only locked in, in a moment in time, based on the available information that we have, knowing that with new information, with new perspectives, that that truth could evolve. I'm just gonna let that sit there for a minute so people can uh, think on that, the power. Uh, right then show me your role models and i'll show you your future so oh we're about to read the tea leaves now aren't we i believe we have i believe you have a thought experiment jeremy something an activity for us an activity that we're going to do and perhaps the listeners and watchers could do as well to help with their clear thinking yeah so in the in this in this chapter in part two uh shane paris references the idea of having um having role models to look up to and to kind of be able to almost ask them questions if they were alive and sitting right by you and this is a, a an old book that i read a long time ago think and grow rich by napoleon hill and he called it the council of invisible invisible advisors where he would literally sit at a table and you know pretend he was talking to henry ford abe lincoln you know all by himself because they he knew enough about those individuals that he could imagine their perspectives, right? So it's really an interesting experiment to start asking questions to people that you really look up to, even though they're as a thought experiment. So Mark, who is on your council of, of invisible advisors? Your council and, of invisible and why? advisors. And why? Yeah. yeah, because it goes back to this thing, you know, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And, you know, I live up a mountain. I don't have access to so many great minds or you know your circumstance dictates so the idea is to create your own five people board of directors around you that you can use to inspire you in different walks of life. i've approached this in 
trying to think clearer. So before I came up with my names, I thought about how I was going to use this board of directors in like which parts of my life, like how I'm going to have this board of directors of these great people. How are they going to help me in which sphere? So I chose um, a few. So these are my, this is my board of invisible. <laughs> um, oh, wait, wait, hold on. Hey, Shane Parrish. So I've check, got, check out, you're on the list, my guy. So I've like, got on my list, Paul Schrader, Epictetus, Joan Didion and Hunter S. Thompson as one, Shane Parrish, um, Dr. Becky Kennedy and Cal Newport. So, and basically I've chosen these for different parts of my life that I want to think clearer on or be better. So any that you'd like me to start with first, any on there that, so the the Joan Didion actually, so you introduced me to her. I read um, the Babylon was or Bethlehem, something about Bethlehem. Oh, oh yeah, slouching to Bethlehem. Slouching yeah. to Beth. I, I read that after you had referenced it. I freaking loved it. Um, yeah, okay. What what about Joan Didion? Um, why is she jo on your list? Joan Didion and Hunter S. Thompson. Okay, um, as a combined entity. Yeah, they're combined. I don't know entity. that that's fair. <laughs> but we'll let we'll allow it. Well, judges, yeah, we'll allow it today they're going to sit there um because so this is for my day-to-day -day writing job so i write a lot about web three and emerging technology these are two of my favorite writers they both have this ability to switch between fiction and non-fiction they both have this kind of fuck you to everybody i'm going to do what i want to do i write like this this is me you like it and if you don't like it well i don't care so they have that kind of in part Swagger. one, we spoke about the the social inertia. They these two had no no social inertia, mm -hmm. um, and their writing is fantastic. And you know, so if I can model what I'm doing on them, so part of this experiment as well is to learn more about these people as well, isn't it? So I get to read more, think about how they would perhaps write, research what they would topics they would talk about, who they they would say no to, who they say yes to. So they're my two writers on the board of directors. What's Dr. Becky? I'm not familiar with that one. Becky Kennedy. Well, let's do one for me, one for you. So you do one of yours. Okay. Yeah, I'll do one of mine. Um, I'll start with an easy one, Bob Marley. Um, yes. So the one thing that, that grabbed me about him was how music can transcend um almost anything right and and there was this one moment during the one love peace concert where he had the both opposing parties in jamaica guys that would have ripped each other's faces off on stage together holding their hands forcing their hands together in in that moment and um you know his music's obviously amazing but what he's done as a as a almost as a leader of a movement um inspires me tremendously and and you know when when i'm when i'm looking when i'm looking for that piece of the puzzle when i'm looking for a little fire uh in how to approach what i'm doing um you know whether it's small or big or whatever he is a he is a great inspiration for me love it and help you to think about your chord progressions as well when you're when you're producing that's right reggae chord progressions tend to be a little little simple but uh you know uh it, but it's reggae simple. strumming isn't so i'm in this cover band and we did a, we did a reggae song could you be loved and like I, I literally never played any reggae in my life really at all it's really hard to to play reggae even though the chord progressions and the chords might be easy the the rhythm isn't what do you know it, it's called a, it's called a one drop have you ever heard of it is called a one drop no why is it called that? so if you're if you're counting uh like you know, counting measures like one, two, three, four, it's two, three, four. It drops the one and that and that leads the it's it's the anticipation in the music that is created by not having the one in the beat that makes reggae rhythm. So it's on the end. So the strum so it starts, it misses the beginning but and joins on Yeah, the and then you have your little chickas, your mm, chick, mm, chick. I mean, there's that piece of it too, but it's the one drop. Yeah, not to dive, not to dive too deep into that. All right, give me one of your others, and I'll throw another one out for me. Um, which one do you want? I'll let you choose. Yeah, the Becky Kennedy, because I know the other guys. I don't know Becky Kennedy. Uh, Becky Kennedy. So I didn't. I don't really know her at all either. Um, I'll read her. I bought her Google. 
Um, Dr. Becky Kennedy is a clinical psychologist, best-selling author and mum of three. She has been named the Millennial Parenting Whisperer by Time magazine and is the founder and CEO of the Good Inside Company, an online parenting advice service. Um, Dr. Kennedy specialises in thinking deeply about what's happening for kids and translating these ideas into simple, actionable strategies for parents to use in their homes. Her goal is to empower parents to feel sturdier and more equipped to manage the challenges of parenting. So one of the, so I had my writing, one of the things I wanted to think clear was it being a parent, parenting. And I actually found Becky Kennedy on the Knowledge Project, which is a Shane Parrish podcast. She was on a few weeks ago. I listened to that. Something clicked the way, what she was saying, something clicked. I was like, I want to know more. I want to read more about her thoughts and how she's approaching parenting and I was looking for a parenting kind of mind for my invisible board of clear thinking directors there you go and um yeah she popped up so I'm going to learn more about her yeah Dr Becky Kennedy amazing amazing all right I'll give you I'll give you two quick ones um on mine one is you have Epictetus on yours so I had Marcus Aurelius on mine I read uh I read Meditations. It actually sits on my nightstand because it's such an approachable book. You can actually just pick it up and there are these little like four or five sentence ramblings that are in there. And what I learned from from Marcus Aurelius is um, managing ego default and being open to that you're wrong and being able to go back first when you are wrong to really understand the truth. So, you know, I, I think about Marcus Aurelius from that mindset and, you know, kind of help me help me open that up a little bit. Um, Richard Feynman okay. is I thought, another, I thought you might have him. Yeah. So I, I think I read, surely you're kidding. Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, like a while back. And that was my first like rabbit hole into physics. I never like took a physics class or anything, but I just became fascinated with his ability to, um, to explain super complex stuff in a very concise way. So whenever I'm trying to explain something new to somebody, and a lot of times I am because, you know, we think we think about what's coming next, not what already is. And, you know, when you're talking about something new, you have to really explain it pretty clearly. So, um, you know, he has the Feynman diagrams, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, being able to explain something really clearly is kind of a superpower. So I'd, uh, I lean on him when I'm uh, when I'm sounding a little complex. I ask He's- him what's up. Richard Feynman, he's he's the person responsible for this whole culture of explain it like I'm five, isn't he? He he was the one who kind of, you know, you have to get down into that level of understanding so you can explain it to someone who's five. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, what uh, I know we could probably go more and more on this. Maybe we can share a couple of more uh, as we go through the different parts of the book. Share more of our. Uh, advisors list. What what are some what are some closing thoughts that you have on part two that uh, um, that we can carry into part three? Well, I think everyone should create their own board of directors to help them with their thinking. I think that next week we. So, I chose Epictetus because of my ego default. My ego overruled me, and um, I was like, no, I don't want to choose Marcus Aurelius or Seneca. Um, Marcus Aurelius, he was he was the richest man in Rome. He was the emperor. Of course, life was easy for him. You know, he had to put out some fires and stop a few wars. But um, Epictetus, born into slavery, he had it bad. I think his his master kind of smashed his leg. So um, <laughs> him. Um, gen- the take home of this part for me was that in order to be self-accountable, self-knowledgeable, have self-control and self-confidence. You need to channel, hijack, take from other people who have accomplished this to a higher level than you and use them as a benchmark on which you can augment your own thinking, think clearer and you know what would they do in this situation. So I'm going to use it this week and I think you are and we'll let people know how it goes yeah and hey post in the comments what who are your advisors who do you lean on like drop it in the comments let us know and you know um more likely than not you know there'll be interesting folks for for us to look into that if we don't know them already so chime in we would love to hear from you and uh hope you're enjoying the book club share it with some friends we're going to continue on with shane parish and um 
that'll do it from here, huh? Yeah, like, subscribe, share with your book lovers, and we'll see you next week for part three of Clear Thinking, um, which James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, calls an indispensable guide to making smart, smart decisions every day. So on that note, stay disruptive, stay curious. Keep thinking on paper. <laughs>